you giving, that's how we live it Don't be mad at the system, it's simply how we've existed I hear a lot of people talking like they politicians And choose to be an accountant because it's safe in the business Not because they wanna do it, just because they heard it pays And who the fuck wants to be poor, no one, that's how we've been raised Society is getting heavy, I can feel the weight The pressure of success is like a hundred million pounds of shit how you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Today, we're going to revisit the topic of finding prison contraband. It's a topic that a lot of my audience wants to hear again, especially the new boots. They want to be out there. They want to find some contraband. And I think that there is a different perspective that we can provide today. But I do want to have the man of the hour when it comes to prison contraband, Russ Hamilton. Russ, long time no see. How you been, brother? Housekeepers of Chaos going. Man, Keepers of Chaos is doing great. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, engagement, a lot of interaction, uh, lots of good stuff happening there. Uh, trying to work on, uh, you know, uh, doing the Tough Mudder thing as a team, uh, Keepers of Chaos, you know, come this next summer. Um, hopefully, we're going to have some dates to announce soon. I gotta, I'm got i having a little trouble putting it all together, but I am going to do that. And uh, most of all, though, I am jazzed to be here talking about my number one love, contraband. I'll tell you, there's nothing like feeling your heart start to squeeze harder when you see that shank coming out of a wall or that cell phone or dope or whatever it is you're going after. Um, I loved making that stuff happen. I loved being able to do that day in and day out. And so now I just kind of think about it. It gives me goosebumps all over again. Yeah, Russ, I want to touch on a different perspective, which is basically that inner gut feeling. You know, I, I recently had somebody that's getting ready to retire. I mean, technically they are, they're just using their days. And we were talking about experience and we want to try to hold on to that. And I think like a lot of people don't understand that sometimes when you become a master at the trade, you start to see things that other people can't see and you start to feel things. And before you even connect the pieces as to why you feel it, you already found the contraband. It just becomes so connected to who you are. And I want to kind of cross into that today when we're discussing about how you find prison contraband. And again, I, I think it's just an interesting topic that our audience is going to love. Now, guys, if you haven't, the show Tear Talks for you, brave men and women that work in corrections, so please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. We're going to go to our sponsor. When we come back, we're going to break down finding prison contraband. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. Inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is going to save your career. It's going to save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation. Available now. Link in description. All right, Russell, real quick, for anybody from the outside looking in, can we just break down what I, what I mean by prison contraband? Okay, yeah, so for uh, prison contraband is anything they're not supposed to have. Sometimes some of those items that they're not supposed to have um, are felonies. Um, some places it's a felony for them to possess a cell phone. It's at least a very serious misdemeanor. It's almost always a felony for them to possess any sort of weapon. Uh, any sort of drugs, uh, that sort of thing, cash. Um, there's other minor things, tattoo ink, tattoo guns, uh, you know, excess property like stamps or things like that. All of that could be considered uh, contraband. I chose to try and focus 
on the dangerous contraband, though. I was known for finding shanks. And of course, in the uh, course of finding all of that, I found a lot of other things, too, over the years. Yeah, and I'll tell you, Russ, uh, people that I know that know you out of California, you're that guy. I mean, this isn't like, you know, Ru Russ, I, the people that know you, they say you were just that guy. Like, if you were put on a search, you would find stuff. And what made me think about um, a different approach to this topic is I was reading the book Mastery. It talks about becoming that apprentice, learning the trade. It's not about, you know, showing off. It's about learning. And it takes a while. It takes time. But then eventually you start to kind of move yourself up onto the hilltop and you start to see the bigger picture, how things connect. And I think that when you left the field of corrections, you were at that mastery level of finding contraband. And I want to know when you felt that this was your calling, like this was something that you could do and this was something that you could be great at. Well, I'll tell you, I think um, when I look back in my career, the first time where I really, you know, recognized that, you know, that spidey sense, that idea that, hey, something is right here and I need to find it right now, uh, happened to me probably, I want to say it was in the second or maybe third year of my career when I was at San Quentin and I was on a little place there called the West Block Yard. And uh, it's a little yard, kind of a dog leg. And uh, I went out there and I was walking past some fellows and the yard was packed. I mean, it's, it's maybe the size of, you know, five or six uh, basketball courts. And there was, probably, there was probably 300 inmates out there. So it was just jam packed full. And these guys, they're just, you know, carrying on doing the things they normally do. And, and all of a sudden I saw these two guys and one of them had just handed the other one a sandwich. And something went off inside me. And I stopped, I reached over and bent over. I snatched that sandwich away from him and I pulled it apart. And inside was a needle and syringe. And that was my first taste of like that, you know, that subconscious drive, that gut feeling that sometimes you get. And I went on from there to, uh, you know, always be discovering, you know, shanks and all sorts of other things. But that was the uh, that was the point in my career that I can point back to and say, hey, that started to inspire me. Something that I did really paid off. And uh, every time after that, I just got that same rush, that same feeling of finding something important, finding something dangerous, finding something that's not going to cause the death of a fellow staff member or an inmate or whatever. Russ, and I remember me and you discussing that the finding of contraband is something that obviously does have that great reward. I mean, you know, you're right, the potential for it to hurt or kill someone, so the lives that you're saving. Uh, and for those people that don't take searches seriously, look what Russ just said. You know, if you're going at it complacently and you're missing out on the contraband because you're not giving it 100%, then there's the likelihood that if you didn't do the search the way it should be done, that someone is going to get hurt. Someone is going to get killed. And, and Russ, uh, obviously you've been on a lot of searches and I'm sure there are times when you just don't come up with, you know, items. I mean, it happens, you know, I mean, you know, we do random searches that really aren't um, targeted searches. They're just maybe daily routine searches that, you know, you got to go through it, you got to do it, but you still want to do it a hundred percent. How did you stop yourself from becoming complacent when, you know, there are times that you're not going to find something. How do, how do you still stay motivated to keep on giving it 100%? Well, what you have to do is you have to, um, you have to understand the balance of the two things. I was always at my best when I was, you know, targeting things, uh, whether it was, um, you know, some body language or some group dynamics that I was looking at or just studying the types of people that were uh, living in certain cells or dorms. But there's another part. It's that exclusionary type of search where you have to make sure uh, a cell or a dorm is free of contraband so that you can go on to the next level and make a certain area secure. So those can be kind of tedious because you have to be very thorough. And so there's not always necessarily that reward. But at the same time, you never know what you're going to find. And there were times where I wasn't expecting, I wasn't targeting. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'd be finding it, you know, I'd find, you know, a book of uh, uh, a book of, you know, little tiny uh, kites that were, you know, gangs that were running the yard or, you know, maybe a little, you know, few hits of heroin, some, uh, 
needles, some shanks. And those things were just out of the blue. It was just like a bonus to me. Um, but yeah, you have to, you have to strike that balance and you have to understand that what you're doing at that moment in time has that ripple effect going forward. And uh, you might be saving a life because you're taking the time to do that thorough search or to try and do that exclusionary thing where you're trying to make sure an area is clear of contraband. So, you know, it's really, like I say, just a balancing act. Now, Russ, just real quick, just some, a surface question right here before we go into what I want to really pull is the foundation of what makes you who you are when you're doing a search. But we've covered it in the last show, uh, but just to touch on uh, a little bit for the audience that didn't see the last show, uh, what are some of the certain areas that you may find contraband in, like basically in public areas or in a cell, like any areas that you should target that maybe not that many people know about? Okay, so um, if you read like one of the articles um, that I've done, I talk about, you know, people always ask me, you know, well, where should I look? And I always tell them it's not about where you look so much as why you're looking there. Um, so I will start with some things is, you know, the entries to doorways of dorms or cells are always great places because those are transitional areas where people can keep the contraband away from them and not have it placed in their possession, you know, by constructive, um, uh, you know, by that whole uh, constructive possession thing that we sometimes have to use in corrections in order to get a bad guy um, off, of the, off of the cell block. So I always focus on that. That's what I call the crease area. Also areas between where you might have different uh, gangs housed. Um, those are uh, other transitional areas where they'll try and leave weapons near or on that area so that if they're gonna go into battle against that other gang, um, they can get them there. As far as inside the cells or inside the dorms, uh, you know, anything that, can, uh, anything that can be used to hide something like a little book, um, oftentimes, uh, you know, you'll just be looking in like, you know, cans, you'd think that, you know, maybe some coffee cream or it looks really innocuous, you shake it back and forth, nothing's going on down there, but way at the bottom, there'll be a false bottom. You've got to have, you know, you've got to be bringing some stuff with you, like uh, some bags to pour all that powder out and look down in there, make sure there's no false bottom. Maybe you find, you know, a little hit of heroin, one hit of heroin so often down in the bottom of something like that. And so really, you just want to try and go to the places, go to the things where you have the highest possibility of striking it rich. So I focus on those areas and those people that are involved with that kind of trade and then just try and uh, really thoroughly go through that type of uh, uh, hiding spots. Yeah, you know, Russ, um, I remember when I was a sergeant and as I was working the prison I was in, it was a maximum security prison, I was watching one of the officers. He was my go-to person. and He was really doing the search above and beyond him and his partner. His partner came out and not as sweaty. This gentleman the officer that I have a lot of respect for was soaked. I mean, just, you could tell he was going through it all and it was a targeted search. And as he's going through it, he, he's not finding what he thinks is in there. Uh, and it's funny because the other officer kind of went through the motions and he was done with his search. You know, he, however, they broke the room up, you know, he felt confident he had done enough and he stepped out. But the other officer, you know, my boy, he's still in that room going back through some of the other things he searched. And then at one moment, he just stopped. And he stayed in the room, by the way. He just looks around. Like, like he wasn't giving up. He just looked around. And then after a couple seconds, motivated himself to continue going. And one thing I wanted to ask him, which I never did, you know, as I'm thinking of it now, was during that moment, because by the way, he did find something that day. He found the charger for a cell phone. Okay? He, he kind of took a break, took a breather, reinvented himself, and then went right back at it to what he was doing. I mean, this person would not quit. You put this person on a search, and he's going to be in that search for an hour, but he's going to be working for that hour, hour and a half. And uh, I never asked him something, and maybe, maybe you can answer this, because maybe you had these moments too. What do you think went through his mind after you know, he stopped at the beginning to take that quick break and then re-motivated himself to go ahead and continue and then eventually find that contraband after doing it for about an hour and not finding nothing. 
I'll tell you what, I ask myself two questions when I'm doing a search. I say, where would I put it and why would I put it there? And uh, so it's not enough to just have the where, you have to have the why. Um, does that particular item need to be close to a door um, in order so that it can be, you know, passed out and used in a riot? You know, maybe it's a shank, maybe it's some kind of truncheon or something like that. Um, does it need to be in a space where you can access it really, really quickly like you would maybe have to do uh, when you're selling some dope or passing that along? Um, or is it something that you can hide and bury and wait to come out late at night? It's going to take you a little while to get to it, like a cell phone or something like that. So it's the where and it's the why. I had, um, I had a situation where um, I was uh, having um, a little cadre of officers with me and we were searching this one dorm and in this dorm up above, there was a piece of uh, drywall and the inmates had kind of busted it up and stuff. And I got up there and I checked it real close with my mirror and there was nothing, there was nothing in there. And I got down and I started to walk away and I went back and searched it again. Well, this happened like four or five times. I started to feel like I was, you know, kind of uh, either stressing out or, or flipping out or something. And then finally, I put my mirror in there this one time and I just saw that the drywall didn't look quite right in this one place where it was punched through. And I managed to stick something up in there and knock it loose. And it was a little toothbrush shank. Nice little cute one. And I thought to myself, you know what? This comes from my subconscious, which is seeing something that the conscious mind doesn't realize. It's that gut feeling where I went back time and time. It didn't make any sense to me then. So that where and that when is really important. And sometimes uh, when you can recognize those things, you can produce contraband that no one else is able to recover because this particular dorm had just been hit the day before, and I'm sure that that particular, um, that particular shank had stood the test of time in that one spot time and time again, but I managed to get it out of there. You know, what's funny is uh, I like what you said about, you know, where I would put something and why, because that why really helps you remember to always check those areas. I, I always tell people the why is so important. The why is the understanding, the justification and I remember talking to him again I really looked for I, I, I really looked up to this guy you know sometimes you could be a supervisor and just look up to one of your officers I just felt that this person was so committed uh, and just really was on the job just really knew the job and uh, he, he was my go-to person good person just a good all-around officer just a good person and I remember when he found the charger, and I, I can't remember where the charger was. Uh, and if it comes to me, I'll, I'll, I'll try to bring it up during another show. But when I went to ask him, because I pretty much watched this guy search. I watched him. I, I was just so intrigued by how he was moving around. And, I, and I, I was learning at the time. So I was just absorbing it. I didn't even know I was watching him for the whole hour and change. I mean, I just was watching how he moved. And when he found the item, and, and I hope we have the dialogue again because I forgot where it was, but it was in such a unique spot that I asked him, what made you check that? And just like you just said, he had no answer. He's like, I just was pushed towards it. Like as if something connected in his mind, but he didn't take the time out to realize that connection. His body was already acting on it. And then later on, maybe he could figure out what made him check. But to me, that's when you know you're at that level. You know, when you're, when, when you're not, you know, it's like, you know, people that are good or ma at good at math, like some people have to see the formula and do it. And some people will just give you the answer. He just had the answer without even having to know the formula because it became automatic. And I, I, I don't know if, if, if that happens as, as you moved up, Russ, like when, when you were doing searches at first, I'm sure, especially the new boots that are watching this now, it's step by step. You're, you're learning the trade, you know, you're, you're, you're doing it step by step, but then eventually it starts to become automatic, correct? Yeah, you start to be able to, you know, place things, um, you know, in your mind about how things might be even playing out in a certain cell block um, or area. You start to know the players. Um, you have an idea of maybe who's moving some weight through there. Maybe you have an idea of uh, someone who's, uh, you know, maybe in need of a weapon or going to use a weapon. 
And those things start to come into play. And those are the things that start to flesh out your ability to actually uh, pick good targets. I mean, it's easy to pick a target. It's picking the right target that's really key. Um, you know, I remember uh, a search that I did. I was talking about this very concept um, with uh, one of my young officers because he wanted to, you know, he wanted to come along and, and you know, see how I did it. And so uh, we were in this one common area that had a bathroom. And I looked up and I said, I think I see a string up there. And so it took a little while to look for it. But yeah, sure enough, I found a string. Pretty soon I was able to get a hold of it and pulled down through this, uh, through the rafters and through this vent, a nice great big ball of dope, you know? And uh, man, he was just floored, you know, we found that dope. And as it fell into my hand um, and we were in that little bathroom area and there was a sink right there, I said, when you find something, something like this, never stop looking. And I reached down and pulled back a towel and there was five gallons of pruno right there. So, um, you know, that just goes to show you, once you find something, don't stop there. Keep going. There's other things to be found, maybe similar, maybe different. So, um, you know, I'm just trying to put on people the most number of little tiny tips that I can. And that's one of them. You know, Russ, as we go through this, I'm thinking about my years as officer, as an officer. And I remember um, searches are not supposed to be retaliatory by nature. We know that. Um, but sometimes, you know, an inmate could get you and you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to search your stuff. I've been letting you live for so long. I'm really going to search your stuff. And I remember like really going above and beyond. I wasn't, I, I'm never disrespectful when I do a search. I'm not, you know, I'm not destroying the person's area. Uh, that's, that's the retaliatory report. I think, you know, I'm still going to be respectful, but I think part of what motivated me to really go into that search uh, was, I mean, to really go above and beyond was because I knew that inmate. I knew that inmate. Like, I, I just, I, I, I couldn't, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's personal because it, it, it's going to sound, sound like it is, but I, I don't think it was. I just think I know this inmate and I kept on going above and beyond because I was like, nope, there's got to be something. There's got to be something. And lo and behold, there was. Now, what I found in the female jail I mean, some could say it's a threat, you know, if you wanted to say that, uh, you know, it, 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 it's technically a weapon, you know, I, mean, I guess, you know, it, it has, has the ability to shank, you know, <laughs> just the wounds already open. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm a, I worked at a female facility, man. Um, but, but you ever, yeah, but, uh, but I think also knowing the inmates well can also motivate uh, your drive to do a search, correct? I mean, is there ever a moment where you're not finding something you're like, man, I know this inmate, there's got to be something. Yeah, you know, sometimes um, I always said that, you know, these guys, they want to bring attention to themselves. They must want me to search their stuff. And you would think that um, that wouldn't be so, but somewhere deep inside, they feel untouchable and they feel like uh, they've hit it too well. And the next thing you know, you're coming out of their locker with a cell phone or a shank and it's time to click the bracelets on. And then it's over, you know, and that's where that's where you can really, really, truly hurt an inmate uh, rather than doing a retaliatory search and tearing up all the stuff, which can be done. And I'm not going to say that I haven't found a, a time and place for it. But if you really want to um, put the inmate in the hurt, take the dope away from him, take the dope away from his homies, uh, take the cell phones away from his homies. Don't let them get that stuff out there ruin and intercept their economy and destroy their economy, you know, make them go bankrupt. And that is legitimate. And they will get to a point where at the very least, they will leave you alone. Hey, you're, you're out. Okay. Hey, so I know some people may ask again, from the outside looking in or people that are relatively new, because we said retaliatory searches. That's kind of like, uh, you know, jargon for our profession. Uh, how, how would you define a retaliatory search? Well, you know, there, there's some of those officers, especially the young ones, um, who really only see uh, within the range of the moment. And so they feel like, you know, they have to get back right then. And a retaliatory search can be where they're going in 
and they're just, you know, totally trashing the guy's stuff. And um, I'll be the first one to say that I've used that before, but what I found is much more effective and much more long-term is to be the one that's intercepting what this guy's got in the way of contraband, intercepting what his homeboys have in the way of contraband. If you're disrupting a, a multi-thousand dollar drug chain by the fact that they want, you know, some special attention put their way, they'll start leaving you alone. You start coming up with that kind of stuff. I've put uh, the hurt on so many supply chains of both drugs and cell phones and shanks and even just uh, even stuff that's just a hustle, you know. I went in there one time and, you know, took a guy's uh, homemade soldering gun and all of his little tools for doing his repairs because he was, you know, he was uh, making it hard for us to operate. So, um, you know, that idea that there is um, retaliation and then there's that idea of this person is bringing attention to themselves. And in that attention, I need to disrupt whatever he's doing that's illegal. So that's my personal take on it. Yeah, I, I think for me, I, I, obviously we're on the same page. You want to have the motivation for the search to be the right reasons. Again, you're spending your energy. So, you know, if you get a chance to do a targeted search, do the targeted search. Obviously, we have a random search. But, you know, the retaliatory searches tend to look unprofessional. And then, unfortunately, what happens is you wind up destroying things that the inmate actually may win uh, some money back through property claims. So even if you have it, you know, you and this inmate aren't see eye to eye, like Russ said, you could be professional and do the search and find something. You know, I, I used to, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not saying I put stuff back, but, you know, I put stuff. And plus, you want to be neat with it because if you, you want to, you know, have a bit of a rhythm and like, okay, if I'm looking at clothes, whatever it is, I put them on the bed. You know, I, I, I wouldn't make a mess out of everything. You know, I, I, would, I would be strategic. Because also, no offense, if you're just destroying shit and making a mess, what about if you have to go back through it? You know, what about if it's like, oh, let me go back and check here. You know, you, you kind of keep the search more organized. Hey, Russ, did, did in your academy, was there training for searches? Yeah, when I did the academy, there was uh, training for search. And, of course, it was, you know, corrections 101, good stuff that you need to know. Uh, you know, how to conduct the proper pat search, how to conduct the proper cell search, how to partition a room, going clockwise, counterclockwise up and down so that you're uh, so that you're doing, you know, a small grid inside it. And that's stuff that, you know, people need to know, but that's, uh, but that's first year stuff. That's, you know, the stuff that you use later on in your career, but only to do those, ex those exclusionary searches where you're either looking for something specific or you're trying to make sure an area is devoid of uh, contraband of one type or another. Right, but it, it, I agree, and it's definitely good to have that as a foundation, right? Because I'm sure that you were able to take what that was originally, well, take what was originally given you at the beginning of your career, use that as the foundation, and then start, you know, making it your own. And the funny thing is, Russ, I will say one thing. When you start becoming a master, you do start seeing the higher level connections, I guess in this case, how you're doing your searches, and then you start implementing strategies that work for you that you're able now to teach. And that only perfects the game. That's the evolution. So during the process of, you know, you becoming a master in this, because you are, I don't care what anybody says, you are. What are some of the things that you've developed that may have been, you know, eventually later incorporated by the people that um, you, you've trained that they may have taken with them throughout their career? So, yeah, um, one of the things that I often would hit on would be uh, body language and uh, going through, uh, for instance, uh, a common area or a dorm. Um, I brought a bunch of um, officers with me one time. And what we were doing was, is I was just showing them how to look for that specific body language. And so as we walked uh, through this common area, there were uh, two different inmates there. And one of them, you know, I saw him kind of sit up just a little, just a little bit quick, just a, a tiny bit too quick. And then the other one, he dropped a towel and walked away from that area. So I knew that the guy walking away from that area didn't want to be in that area. So that area had to contain the contraband. So I told my officer, cuff him up and look right there. Sure enough, you know, five gallons of Pruno. The other guy, I said, you know what? He sat up too quick. Look under his pillow. And there he had a cell phone, 
right? So I got those off of just two quick reads, you know, at, at one time. And I would go into these dorms and do this kind of thing all day long. And uh, so what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to translate the signals that the inmates are sending you in order to understand where the movement of the contraband is taking place. And um, there's all kinds of different ways that you can do it. There's so many different um, methods you can use to develop it. The main thing is just to get in there and try over and over again. I had a good friend of mine, uh, Ronnie Dunnigan. He was my tower officer. And uh, at, there were times where, you know, I would just walk out there and he would call me later and tell me where inmates were suddenly paying attention to me as I was out on the yard. And then I would know from him because they were pretty good about making sure that I wasn't uh, scoping them out. And, uh, but he could read their body language. And so it was a third party intercept. I would go back to where he was talking about where these inmates had been acting funny and come up with, you know, major contraband. I mean, uh, weapons and drugs and cell phones, and they could never catch on. They never understood that my eye in the sky was able to look at their body language based on me walking by them and tell me if they had contraband or not. So, um, you know, the world is what it is. You need to go out there and find your own ways of discovering these things and figuring it out and unlocking the clues. I had um, one particular uh, dining hall that I worked in, and it was the funnest thing in the world to me to watch out of the corner of my eye. Some guys sneak back in line because we didn't have enough uh, officers to cover the whole thing. And then I'd walk to the front of the line and wait. And I before they even got there, I'd start identifying inmates by them giving me their ID. And so I knew which area they came from and uh, that they were okay to be seated. The other ones that had snuck back in line, their cards had a different uh, area on it. And as they would come up to me, they would start giving the typical body language. And so I already knew ahead of time, it was no big deal to me, but I started to learn and translate the same signals that I saw from them to other inmates that I was dealing with out on the yard. And that taught me how to pick up on those cues. And so to me, it was kind of, it was just a way to train myself to be able to see the visual cues, to be able to see what inmate might be having contraband. So I take that and I translate it in to walking into a common area. And suddenly that same type of inmate, you know, he's doing the same thing. He's suddenly looking away, making too much eye contact, freezing, suddenly moving. And then it'd be a matter of, hand over the cell phone. And so eventually that was what I was able to develop. That was what I was able to bring. Um, my last two years um, on in those uh, three different units that I was uh, assigned to, I managed to recover 55 weapons. And I can't begin to tell you the number of cell phones. Hey, you know, Russ, actually <laughs> brought up, you brought up something that uh, made me think. I remember working with a supervisor, and it's right off what you're saying, right off what you're saying that when you would do an unannounced tour, uh, an un I'm sorry, an unannounced search, and you're running in, and, you know, basically as soon as you get in there, the search is underway, wherever those inmates are, they're getting down to the floor, whatever it was. I remember that you would have your team that would come in and go right to the search, but he would put one or two officers on the cameras, and they would keep on watching the beginning of the camera again and again to see, you know, where these inmates are going, what kind of signs. And then they would go back, the sergeant would go back and say, all right, what did you see? And where do you think we should go? And, and, and that actually helped get some of the contraband that was actually in the public area, you know, because inmates are, as soon as they, they look right to where that area is. He, he said it, he goes, as soon as you come in and do that unannounced tour, or unannounced search, I'm sorry, as soon as you come in and do the unannounced search, the first thing the inmate does after they hear you coming in is they look right to where that weapon may be. Is, is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, I have, I mean, I could tell you of hundreds of instances where that little split second of surprise, uh, really you're able to capitalize on it, see where an individual is looking or see where an individual sometimes looks away from. Or um, suddenly, uh, you know, these guys, suddenly they'll get boisterous and they'll be talking about something and they're trying to cover up and call attention so someone else, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet away knows uh, to, you know, start ditching the contraband. And uh, I, I mean, I've had many times where we've walked into an area 
and suddenly uh, guys will jump down off of a bunk or off of the table and start fighting right there. Yeah, well, they're trying to take your eyes off of something really valuable. Understand that um, in prison um, that uh, drugs have a lot of monetary value and things like weapons, uh, those things are also felonies and they can cost you a lot of time. And what is time except money? Well said, Russ. Hey, Russ, do you have anything you want to say in close? I know this is a topic that's close to your heart. And uh, I know we covered it before where we talked about the specifics of where things could be, you know, just giving out some tips. And I think right now we really talked about like motivations, experience, and higher level functions of, of how to discover contraband. But I don't know. Do you think that maybe there's enough room for a future dialogue? Absolutely. This is one of those things that, uh, you know, you can never teach enough of. And there's always a new generation coming up uh, behind the last generation that hasn't heard any of this uh, stuff that I've talked about, um, that maybe they haven't had the opportunity to really work around a situation where someone is really focusing on the contraband. Um, I've walked into uh, units where, you know, they've just kind of been going through the motions. Um, every officer is doing his three locker searches a day and they're never finding anything. And uh, they really think that there's nothing to be found um, in an area, in an entire yard. They think that they've got it under control. And uh, I've walked in and destroyed that little fantasy of theirs where just by going in and, you know, taking three weapons out of one dorm. And they were just shocked, you know, because they were only going through the motions. They weren't looking at that deeper level and they weren't trying hard enough and they weren't targeting the right people. And that really gets us all the way back to complacency. We don't want to be complacent about what we're doing. We always want to think the worst of what's going on in that unit. So we really have to attack it. And I mean, it really takes a lot of energy, you know, to go in there and be turning over mattresses and feeling on things and trying to be the one that discovers all this stuff. Um, but there's such a reward to it too. There is that reward, that satisfaction of knowing that you're impacting this thing. Um, the last, the very last mass search that I was on, um, we went out uh, to a fire camp. And uh, this, I guess I can tell this story now. I think it's, I think it's been enough years. Uh, at this fire camp, we had a uh, reasonable, uh, not just suspicion, but we had a, an inside source that told us that there was a gun on the premises. And as we went to go in there, uh, we took the entire camp down uh, at gunpoint. We had, the, uh, we had our CERT team there and we went in uh, with guns uh, to each and every dorm, uh, handcuffed each and every inmate, brought them out. And then we went in and did a thorough thorough search of the entire camp and i'll tell you you can't believe the amount of contraband that we got out of there uh, i personally recovered i think it was five cell phones and probably 20 pucks of tobacco and the list just goes on and on and on all this stuff that they had fortunately there was no gun and uh, later we found out that there was cause for this particular individual to try and use this to shield some other heat that was coming his way. But uh, the thing was, is, you know, on that search and being in the moment and carrying it through and trying to do your very best, um, uh, it really does bring you that sense of satisfaction. And, uh, you know, also that sense of both camaraderie and both being in competition with all these other guy, guys, you know, I'm going to find more contraband than you. I'm going to find more cell phones. And, uh, if you let yourself be motivated by that, you can do the same exact things. Um, I know I talk about it in one of the articles that I wrote when I first got to San Quentin, there were some of these guys, they had that magic. They walk into a room and turn something over and there would be, you know, a weapon right there. And that was the kind of thing that I wanted to be able to do. I wanted to be able to size things up and do that. The same as them, because these guys were my idols. You know, these guys were on the squad or they had that reputation. And so that's the kind of thing that I want to encourage others, especially you young guys who are just coming into this. Um, there's, you know, almost no better way to make your bones than to be that guy that can go in and find stuff when it needs to be found. I had uh, 
I think my, my last uh, search that I did for uh, Old Boss of Mine, Rich Berglund, um, they found several pieces of an interior fence were missing. And of course, you know, they sprayed it with red paint. They didn't know where they went, where any of the stuff had gone. And, uh, you know, he just had that faith in me. He says, I bet you can find this by the end of your shift. And sure enough, I managed to come up with those pieces. And uh, when they hand over that responsibility to you, there's really nothing like it in the world. But I've waxed on too long here. So uh, go ahead, Anthony. Nah, stop. There's always knowledge that you share. You know, what? one of my goals would be one day, if it could ever happen, is maybe one day we could do a live filming at, you know, maybe a dorm or a cell and you can lead the way and we get a couple of cameras up there and just videotape a nice detailed search led by Russ Hamilton and we'll post it on the Tear Talk channel. And guys, hey, real quick, don't forget to check out the Keepers of Chaos Facebook page. Community is growing. A little slow on YouTube, trying to get to my next milestone of 15,000, one five. Um, so we'll get there. You know, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's the end of the summer. So I'm sure people are doing other things than watching videos on YouTube. Um, but again, I thought this was a great topic. Hopefully um, the people that have been requesting it get exactly what they wanted from it. And uh, maybe also another, t uh, another show we could do one day, Russ, is uh, I know we did the manufactured weapons before, um, but maybe we could touch on that again. Uh, I know there's maybe it may become an event of every, you know, every day. So maybe there's some other avenues we could discuss there. Um, but as always, guys, the show is tiered If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. The bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe. Whoa.